And now, Lifestyles Unlimited presents the Real Estate Investor Radio Show. Over the next hour, we unfold your map to financial freedom. You'll learn how to retire through investing in single family and multifamily real estate. You'll learn how to create cash flow and build wealth so you can have the time and money to live the lifestyle you want. Welcome to the show. My name is Al Gordon, and as always, I'm working on your financial freedom. And on today's show, we're going to get into the topic of buying investment real estate. Now, here's the first thing I need to tell you. When you buy investment real estate, it's a lot different than buying your personal residence. It is. And, and many of you don't know that. Many of you think it's the same process, but it's a completely different process. Now, some, some of the fundamentals are the same. I mean, after all, you, you've got to establish what the price is going to be. You have to determine the condition of the property. You have to decide whether you like the location. There's, there are tangible things that go into the mix that transcend both components. In other words, they appear regardless of whether you're buying investment property or you're buying residential property for you to live in. Does that make sense? But there are some distinct differences, and, and here's what they are. The first thing I think that's the most important is that when you're buying a property for you to live in, it's an emotional purchase. It is. It's an emotional purchase because what you're looking for is you're looking for a place that you're going to habitate in. You're going to live there, and you want certain features. You want certain amenities. You maybe want a certain location. Maybe a certain location, you know, tends to tell other people that, hey, you've made it because you live in that part of town. I mean, there's there's all kinds of factors that go into buying your personal residence. And again, I'm going to take you back to that concept that it's an emotional purchase, because think about it. If you're married, you're not the only one making that decision. Your spouse is also making that decision. And whether or not you would put emotion into the acquisition, your spouse probably is. Because your spouse is walking through the property thinking, I wonder what it would look like if we changed all the flooring and we made it tile instead of the carpet that's in there. And they're also thinking things like, I wonder if we took those curtains down and we put up blinds instead. Or maybe they're thinking, you know, I'd like to gut this kitchen because I just don't like the brand of appliances. I want my brand of appliances in there. And also, I don't like the countertops. I want something that's more stone-oriented as opposed to the, the wood block that's in there. I mean, these are the kinds of things that you think about when you're buying a property for your personal consumption. And that's exactly what you're doing. You're buying a property for personal consumption. Now, some of you think that you're buying that property as an investment. You're investing in your home. But there's a big problem with that analogy. And here it is. That home, it does not pay you an income stream. It costs you money every month to live in that home. The more expensive home you buy, the more money it costs you. If you leverage your purchase, your mortgage payment is going to be a little bit higher, depending on the price that you pay. But what about the investment property? Don't, don't the same things occur? I mean, when you consider investment property, don't you get a little bit emotional over the investment property? You shouldn't. You should not get emotional over an investment property because you're not going to live in that property. As a matter of fact, probably the only time you're going to stand foot in that property is when you're looking to potentially buy it. And even then, you may not even stand foot in that property because you have, you have people on your team that will go investigate the property on your behalf. And then maybe they, they, they do Zoom call with you or something like that. And they, sh they show you around the property and they talk to you about the property. See, buying investment property, it's a different animal. It is a completely different animal than buying your personal residence. When you're buying the investment property, you're looking at it from an asset-based factor. What does that mean, an asset-based factor? Well, technically, I just kind of made that up. But what I'm getting at is you're looking to buy an asset and put it into your portfolio. And there are certain things that asset must do in order for it to qualify to go into your portfolio. If it doesn't do certain things, it should not be a part of your portfolio. It's as simple as that. Now, here's the first thing you need to look at when you're buying investment property. What does that property do for you 
from a financial standpoint. Does the property provide you something like cash flow? Cash flow. Yeah, that's something you don't get in your personal residence. You don't get cash flow. Now, many of you that own investment property in places like California or Washington State or, I don't know, New York State, except for maybe the upper parts of New York State, you own property that you rent out, but it doesn't provide you a cash flow. As a matter of fact, you pay money every month into that property, maybe to cover the note or cover any repairs or things like that, because you are following an investment strategy based on appreciation and appreciation only. You live in an area of the country where prices of real estate tend to go up faster than other parts of the country. So if you're going to invest in those parts of the country, you tend to negate the cash flow. But here's what I'm going to tell you. When you do that, you're not really investing. You're speculating. Because here's the problem. That asset is not producing anything to change the trajectory of your life. It's not producing an income stream that you can use to help replace the income stream that you currently receive when you're trading time for money, either working for somebody else or working for yourself. See, that's the key thing about real estate investing. You want to make sure that you're buying assets that produce cash flow. So I've got, I've got a little riddle for you. Which property is a better investment for you? Property A that pays you cash flow of $266 per month. Property B that pays you $368 per month. Or property C that pays you $1,077 per month. So it sounds like property C gives you the best cash flow. And, and on, on, the, on the surface only look, I'd agree. It's property C, right? $1,077. But one of the things that you have to factor into the equation is how much money are you actually investing into the asset? What is the cash out of pocket required in order for you to buy the asset? So when you calculate a return on investment, it gives you a better indication of what the cash flow is doing based on what it costs you to buy the cash flow. Does that make sense? I know it makes sense to you. All right, so let me, let me give you a little bit more information, and maybe this will make a little bit more sense. Property A, the one that only gets you $266 per month, only requires a, an investment of $11,175. That gives you a cash-on-cash cash return of 28.56%. Property B that pays you $368 per month, a little bit more than property A, requires a cash out-of-pocket commitment of $20,400. That gives you a cash-on-cash cash return of 21.65%. So when you, when you compare the cash-on-cash cash return, in other words, what's the return on investment based on the cash flow of the asset, property A does better then property B, although property B pays you more cash flow. The difference between the two is that property B requires you to put almost twice as much money into the asset as property A does. But all of you that were fixated on property C, the one that pays you $1,077 per month, you're probably wondering, well, what's the cash obligation in order to get into the investment? That one works out to be $53,000. It would require you to put $53,000 of your own cash into the asset, and that would produce a cash flow of $1,077 per month. Now, that, that actually gives you a better cash-on-cash cash return than property B because the cash-on-cash cash return for property C is 24.38%. So, which is the better investment? If you're looking at the cash on cash return, in other words, what is the return on investment that I'm receiving, property A, the one that actually pays you the least amount of cash flow, actually does better than the other two properties do because it provides you a higher cash on cash return. Now, one of the things that I need to point out to you is that when I'm giving you these numbers, 
when I'm talking to you about cash on cash returns and I'm talking to you about cash out of pocket requirements, the cash out of pocket requirement that I'm indicating to you is less than what you think it ought to be. What do I mean by that? Okay, let's let's break it down. When you buy your personal residence, okay, unless unless you're using government financing, an FHA or a VA loan, or you're using some kind of specialized conventional loan where you only have to put 5% down, the majority of loans out there require you to put about 20% down. 20% of the asset cost is what your required down payment is, and you take out a loan for 80%. That's the loan-to-value ratio, 80%. So you're putting 20% down. Now, with the properties that I'm describing to you, when I tell you what the actual purchase prices are and what the actual repair after repair values are of these properties, what you're going to find is that I'm not coming close to putting 20% down on any of these properties. As a matter of fact, I'm putting less money down. How do I do that? Well, I'm taking advantage of something called a hard money loan. What's a hard money loan? A hard money loan is a short-term asset-based loan that is designed to give me money not only for the acquisition of the asset, but also I can use that money up to a certain point, which is 70% of what we call the after repair value. In other words, what that property is worth all fixed up. 70% of that I can spend. Anything over that comes out of my pocket. So when I'm looking at these different assets, I am applying a hard money loan to each of these assets, and I am calculating a lower cash out of pocket amount than your traditional 20% down loan. So for property number A, and I'll tell you what, let's just stick with property number A right now because I'm, I'm feeling like I'm, I'm throwing out a lot of numbers at you guys, and I know you're trying to drive and things like that, and, and, and I don't want you getting into an accident. So I'm going to just focus on property number A because property number A, just based on the cash-on-cash cash return, does the best for me. And if I'm looking for cash-on-cash cash returns as my primary metric for investing, property A gives me a 28.5% six percent return on cash on cash so what does it take cash out of pocket to do the deal for property number a again that number is eleven thousand one hundred seventy five dollars now here's some information that i haven't told you yet that will help complete the picture that particular property is located in a place called south carolina yeah it's a south carolina property it's not what I consider the bread and butter type of property. In other words, it's not a three bedroom, two bath, two car garage. It is a two bedroom, one bath home. And I don't think there's a garage on it. As a matter of fact, when I looked at the listing information, I didn't see any indication of a garage. However, that two bedroom, one bath property is poised to produce a 28.56% return on the cash on cash. I can buy that property for $65,000, $65,000. All fixed up, it's worth $105,000. So there's $40,000 of equity that I'm working with there. And that's where the hard money loan comes into play. We come back from the break, I'm gonna talk to you more about that hard money loan. Stick around. Got questions? Call Lifestyles Unlimited at 855-497-4335. The Real Estate Investor Radio Show continues next. Need more unconventional wisdom that'll set you free? Subscribe to Lifestyles Unlimited on YouTube and Ben's content that will actually help you get where you want to go in life from people who are already there. With over 50,000 members and 32 years of proven success, there's so much more we want to share with you than what we have time for on the radio. On YouTube, we go beyond our shows and feature our best content from podcasts, interviews, expo, master's tour, fireside chats, special events, and more. Creating the lifestyle you've always wanted. You're hearing Lifestyles Unlimited's Real Estate Investor Radio Show. Welcome back to the second half of the Lifestyles Unlimited Real Estate Investor Radio Show. My name is Al Gordon, and as always, I'm working on your financial freedom. And on today's show, we're, we're talking about buying houses. And we're talking about buying not just any house, but investment property. I'm not talking about buying your principal residence. 
that is a completely different type of purchase transaction because you are emotionally attached to that property. No matter how much you want to convince yourself that you're not, you are. But when it comes to investment property, you need to keep the emotions out of the arena. If you find yourself being emotionally attached to that pretty little broken down house that you want to buy, stop right there and don't buy the house because it will cause you to make business decisions that are contrary to the good business decisions that you're supposed to make when you're buying investment property. Now, leading up to the break, I, I told you about three different properties, and I kind of gave you a breakdown of what their cash on cash returns are. And, and, and I'll be clear and honest with you that all three of these properties are excellent cash on cash return properties. All of these properties produce at least 21% cash on cash returns. But of the three properties, one of them produces a superior cash on cash return at 28.56%. And ironically, it also produces the least amount of physical cash every month at $266. So why, why is this property that produces the least amount of cash the best investment asset when you're looking at cash on cash returns? Because it's based on the amount of money you physically have to put into the deal. Now, the other thing that I need to share with you is the concept of a hard money loan. We talked about it a little bit earlier in the show, but I think it begs uh, being repeated because it's one of those concepts that once, once you fully understand it, it's, it's like riding a bike. But like riding a bike, you might fall off it a couple times while you're trying to figure it out. Does that make sense? But the good news about figuring out how a hard money loan works is that you're not going to wind up with scuffed knees. Yeah, so there's, there's a benefit there. So we were, we were focusing on one of the three properties, and this particular property just happens to be in South Carolina, and you can buy it for $65,000. That's, that's the available purchase price. All fixed up, that property would trade in the open market for $105,000. So the difference between that $105,000 after repair value and that $65,000 purchase price is about $40,000. There's $40,000 worth of equity that we want to tap into and, and obtain because we're going to use that equity in conjunction with that hard money loan to keep our cash out of pocket expense to a minimum. By using a hard money loan on this particular asset, our cash out of pocket expense is only $11,175. So when you, when you calculate the annual cash flow on this asset, so you take the $266 of cash flow that it can produce, and you annualize it, you come up with $3,192. When you divide that by the $11,175 that you would have to actually physically invest into the asset, you're getting a cash-on-cash cash return of 28.56% just on the cash on cash. I'm not even talking about the different equity ways that we make money in this asset. I'm just talking about the cash on cash. What are you investing in right now that is producing for you a 28.56% cash on cash return? Yeah, I'm waiting. I know you're thinking about it. You're not getting it, are you? And if you are getting some kind of cash on cash return, it's probably tied up with one of those 401ks or IRAs or one of those government-sponsored so-called retirement accounts, in which case that cash component doesn't come to you. You can't choose to do with it what you want to do with it. You have to do with it what the government says you have to do with it, which is nothing. It has to go into that account. It has to stay in that account until you take it out of that account. And when you take it out of that account, you'll pay the taxes on it at that time. And if you're not 59 and a half years of age or older, you'll pay a 10% penalty. Yeah, that's part of the reason we don't like those 401ks or those IRAs or things like that, because they don't really work. Investing in hard assets that you put into your personal portfolio is a better mechanism to get you retired. And I will tell you, a 28.56% cash on cash return can go a long ways to getting you retired pretty quick. When you think about it, you're getting maximum return on your investment. I mean, think about it. An asset that's producing well over 25% per annum, 
will return all of your cash contribution in four years. Even if you do nothing else with the property, you'll get all of your money back within four years. That's not why we buy the property, though. We buy the property because it does produce that cash on cash return so that we can use that cash on cash return for anything that we want. What would you use $266 a month on? Does it cover your power bill? Maybe it covers your car payment. Maybe it covers your insurance for your car. Maybe it covers your cost of lunches where you work. I don't, I don't know what you would use it for, but it is supplemental income that's coming into your household to the tune of over $3,100 per year. And that's like giving yourself a $3,100 a year raise. When's the last time your boss gave you a $3,100 a year raise? Yeah, okay. Now, some of you are going, well, I just, I just got a cost of living raise. Okay, you just got a cost of living raise, and you had to wait and wait and wait, and you got it, right? And what's happening in the economy? Things are still going up and up and up, so that cost of living raise isn't doing much for you. And somebody else had to make the decision for you to get that. Did they not? And they could have given you nada, bupkis, zero. Many of you got zero for a cost of living raise over the last year. But when you buy real estate, here's the thing. You give yourself a raise each time you put one of these assets into your portfolio. It's a beautiful thing. Now, let me go back to the asset. So we were talking about the fact that you can buy it for $65,000 and all fixed up, it's worth $105,000, right? So many of you would think, that you would buy this thing by going to your bank and taking out a loan. And, and your bank would loan you 80% loan to value, but based on the value of the property as it sits right now. The property is only worth $65,000 in its present state. So they're only going to loan you 80% of that $65,000. You're going to have to come in with about, what does that work out to be, about $13,000 in, in a down payment? And here's the other thing. You're going to have about $22,500 in rehab and closing costs that the bank isn't going to pay for. So you're going to have to tack that on to the $13,500 that you're putting into the property. So when you're buying distressed properties, you're going to buy them at a discounted rate. The market tends to indicate to you what that discounted rate could be. Now, of course, you can use the finesse of being a real estate investor and knowing, you know, what the cost of repairs are for things and things like that. But the point I'm trying to make is you're not paying 100% of retail value. You're paying a percentage of that retail value. There is a cost to do the rehab and there is a cost for closing and holding costs. It doesn't matter what the time is because you calculate what the closing and holding costs will be. And when you do that and you add whatever those additional costs are for the rehab and the closing and holding costs to your purchase price, you are still at a wholesale price. The difference between that all-in cost and the after repair value or the full re appraisal value price of that property is the net equity that you capture in the asset. That's additional equity that you obtain in the asset over and above what you physically put into the property. So I'll tell you what, let's go back to that uh, property number A that we were talking about earlier in the show. Property number A it has an after repair value of $105,000. We can buy it for $65,000. I know for a fact this property has a lot of deferred maintenance, but it's not really a lot of deferred maintenance because my repair estimate on this asset, as well as the closing and holding costs, is only $22,500. What that means is that I'm going to capture a net equity of an additional $17,500 in that asset. Now, it's going to cost me $11,175 to buy the asset. And, and if I'm using a hard money loan, that's what my actual cost is going to be. If I try to do it the conventional way, like some of you might want to do it, my, my number is going to be skewed really bad, and it's, it's not going to work out. But when you factor in the fact that I'm putting $11,175 of my own money into the deal, and I'm capturing an additional equity component of $17,500, I'm getting 156.6% .6 return on capital gain. 
In other words, that additional $17,500 of equity that I obtain in this asset is, uh, is added to the 11175 that I put into the deal. And that gives me a combined equity of well over $28,675. Not well over, that's, that's the actual amount of money. That's the amount of equity that I have in the deal when the dust all settles. So I get 156.6% return based on the fact that I'm keeping all of my costs at wholesale costs, yet I'm still commanding a retail price on that property. Now, there are other ways we make money in real estate. There's the natural appreciation. And if you want to factor what natural appreciation is, use a factor of 3.5%. The reason I say 3.5% is because we know at Lifestyles Unlimited that most real estate assets tend to double in value every 20 years. Faster in some places, slower in other places, but that sweet spot seems to be about 20 years. So how, how do you calculate a doubling effect in 20 years? Well, if your asset goes up about 3.5% per year, year over year, that gets you to that doubling effect in about 20 years. So you can calculate what the natural appreciation could be and should be for your property year over year over year. Another way we make money in real estate has to do with something called principal pay down. What principal pay down is, is the fact that you're going to have a note on that property. Once, once you cure the hard money loan, you're going to put conventional financing on the property and you're going to pay a principal and interest payment. The interest portion is a business write-off. The principal portion is not a business write-off, but it does reduce the amount of money that you owe on the property every month. And in doing so, it increases your overall equity in the property. So you've got, you've, there's two ways that equity increases in your property by you just going through the normal fact of living and operating the property. Pretty cool, right? Then there's the tax advantages. One of the things that real estate does for you is it provides the ability for you to take depreciation write-offs, which are paper write-offs, against your income stream. On this particular asset that I'm talking about, you're going to get about $3,055 in depreciation write-offs, and that comes off the cash-on-cash annual income that you make of $3,192. What that means is your tax liability is only on, now get this, $137, $137, which is probably going to equate for most of you to be about a $27 tax liability. Pretty cool stuff, huh? All right. So what if we took into consideration the five different ways we make money in real estate? What would this property do for us over a five-year hold? Well, this property is actually poised to produce a 500% adjusted capital gain. In other words, if you sell it in a future year, you will make a 499.22% adjusted capital gain. When you strip out the amount of money that you actually put into the deal, it actually reduces your net gain down to 399.22%. Call it 400%. What are you investing in right now that is positioned to make you a 400% return on your investment over a five-year period of time? This is why you need to learn how to be a real estate investor. And by doing so, you can you can program in what type of pay raises you're going to get, because as you buy these properties one after another, it's going to contribute to your portfolio and get you to a place of retirement in five years or less. If you want to do what I'm doing, you want to do what the 50,000 members of Lifestyles Unlimited are doing, go to lifestylesunlimited.com, sign up for a free workshop, and let's get you going. The information and opinions you hear on the Lifestyles Unlimited Real Estate Investor Radio Show are those of the hosts, guests, and callers. The Lifestyles Unlimited Real Estate Investor Radio Show is for entertainment purposes only. Please consult a professional regarding your personal investment needs. Nothing presented constitutes an endorsement, recommendation, offer, or solicitation to buy or sell any product or security.